Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, so today we have uh, uh, Jorge Soto, uh, who is going to be our first speaker of hopefully a series of uh, talks around the topic of civic media. Uh, Jorge is the founder of CityBox, and uh, he's been working on um, technologies that empower citizens uh, to communicate with one another and with the governments. Uh, he was uh, named one of the uh, 35 innovators by MIT Tech Review in Mexico a few months ago. Um, so he has a lot of really interesting stories around these technologies in many different countries. So, Jorge. Well, thank you very much. Um, so we, we have this, um, I have this company, this startup called Citybox, and what we've been doing is uh, we're using technology to uh, provide tools that engage citizens to participate and to collaborate be between each other, and also how they can they connect to their governments, and uh, also how the governments or the institutions can receive citizen reports, manage those, that information, and turn them into, and act upon that information. I'm going to show you uh, a little bit what we're doing, how we are doing it. But um, uh, first of all, it, it all started uh, during the Mexican 2009 elections. Uh, we were, at the, at the time, we had, we, I, I had founded another company at the time. It was an SMS gateway. Uh, we provide all the, all the infrastructure for other companies to send SMS between each other. Uh, and um, we decided to develop a project to track and monitor uh, Mexicans' midterm elections. Um, it was the first time something like that happened in, in the region. Uh, what we did is we put together all the infrastructure that we already had with, with the SMS gateway, and we put together a map where citizens could report and just send all the information that was going on through the, through, during the election. It, it can be uh, um, somebody asked you how, to, how you voted or give you money for your vote, which is very common in Mexico, that kind of practice still. That project was called Cuidemos el Voto, which means let's protect the vote. And it was very successful at the time. Uh, it was replicated uh, in, in the methodology of that was replicated in several countries in Latin America. And it was the first time that we realized the real power of the, of the technology that we had and how citizens really want to participate if they have the, the correct tools for it. Um, it was very simple at the time. It was just sending an SMS uh, validating the information and putting it in a map. No analysis of the information, no tracking of the information. However, we received around uh, we received around fifteen thousand reports that were pro pro uh, forwarded to the to the police. Um, of those reports, unfortunately, back in two thousand and nine, uh, nobody responded. What happened to those reports? But well, we, we've learned a lot from that process. Uh, then, also in two thousand and nine, came. Uh, also, the Mexican, the Mexican government, uh, there was a proposal of taxing the internet. There was a proposal that said that uh, there should be a 3% extra tax of using, uh, using the internet. It was, it was in, two, in November 2009. It was a very stupid idea. It was exactly the opposite of what, what other governments were, do, were doing at the time. Um, so there, this academic from, from the UNAM, from the uh, biggest university in Mexico, created a post saying uh, that internet is a necessity and, and with, with very clear data why this, this tax is regressive. Uh, they interviewed um, uh, a, a, a congressman and they asked him, what do you think about this post that says that internet is a necessity? And, and he said, internet is only a necessity to watch porn. And uh, that kind of, that kind of, of comments uh, generated this conversation on Twitter where the, with the hashtag Internet Necessario, which means Internet is a necessity, we started collecting all that information uh, on, on Twitter. It was, it was 2009. It, Twitter wasn't a big deal in Mexico, but it was the first time that people understood that, that Twitter wasn't just for saying, I'm meeting at this place or I'm reading this kind of book. It, it really helped for citizens to express themselves and to organize themselves even to go out of the streets. They created a, a, a march called uh, No Te Quedes en el Hashtag, which means don't stay on the hashtag, let's go to the streets. And, uh, and we received around 120,000 
different uh, comments of why internet is a necessity. Uh, we process all those comments. We send them an, uh, to an email to every congressman and woman in Mexico. We asked a congress, uh, a senator, what the, does she think about this Twitter movement? And she said, I don't have a Twitter account because I do have a job. So this kind of, this kind of thing really showed the, the, the initial disconnection of this new uh, society that was emerging, or these new connections of citizens, and how our government was responding. This ended up uh, for us receiving an invitation to, to discuss the, this law in the Senate, um, and eventually the law wasn't approved. It was the first time that, uh, that we understood the power of social networks. It was the first time that politicians understood the power of social networks. And since then, the use of Twitter and the use of, of, of uh, other, other kind of digital technology has been used uh, very, very much in Mexico to connect citizens and to alert about different topics. Uh, then, uh, 2010, uh, violence spread out all entire in Mexico. I, 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 I'm sure you heard about it. Um, it didn't happen suddenly. It, it, uh, it happened very slowly. But the, to, the truth is that there was very, a lot of indifference from society at the beginning, and then there was resignation. Um, we, we, did, we didn't know what, what was happening. We didn't, we didn't know that the situation could get out of, so much out of control as it has. Um, but citizens uh, have eventually started or organizing themselves and uh, creating these kind of networks to alert themselves and to, co uh, to contrast uh, all, the, all, this, all the situation. Um, there, are, there are a lot of movements right now, mainly in social networks, that they are trying to tell the stories. They are trying to tell the stories of people. It's not just 50,000 dead people. It's 50,000 names, 50,000 sons, 50,000 uh, uh, brothers. And, uh, but the truth is that there are, there are some cities in the north of Mexico, mainly, that are uh, one bullet away of losing their mind. There's a lot of cows. There's a lot of panic. In, in several cities, a lot of people don't, any, anymore, don't, don't go out anymore at nights. But what has happened is they started using uh, Twitter, they started using local forums to alert themselves. And these kind of, of self-organized uh, communities emerged, mainly in the north of Mexico. And through particular hashtags, uh, people started alerting themselves around the, whether they could go out or not. For example, in Monterrey, in the north of Mexico, there, there's a hashtag called MTYFollow. And at the, at the very beginning, people started saying, there's a gunfight at this place, hashtag MTY follow. So whenever it was, it was, uh, it was amazing when you, go, when you go out at Monterrey and everybody is at a bar or a house of someone and you want to go back to your place, the first thing you do is you go to Twitter, follow the MTY follow hashtag and figure out if you can go to your house and which road to take. Um, these kind of networks are, to, to, be, to, be, to be honest, are very... Um, are very self-controlled. Uh, they, 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 they work in a very artisanal way, to say, to say one thing. Um, but it has worked, and it has connected, it has connected citizens. And in some, in, some, in some way, I think this kind of, th this kind of uh, interactions are reconstructing social fabric in Mexico. Um, it's totally based on trust. And we are understanding that being a citizen should not be a passive, a passive function anymore. We are going out to the streets. We are reclaiming. Uh, our streets back again, and uh, we are filling in the gap where the government has failed to provide the services. Uh, I think new generations, uh, we are not thinking in hierarchies anymore. We are thinking in networks, and we want to see our governments and our institutions as nodes with, within that network. And they are still, our governments and our institutions are respond. this is how they are right now. This is, this is the Department of Administrative Modernization of the Mexico City government. Uh, this photo, I could have taken this picture back in 1992, but I took it in June 2012. Uh, so there is, there is clearly a deficit in the agility, in the innovation, and in the capacity of our institutions to respond to how citizens are already, we are connecting ourselves. This is how they are doing analytics. This is how they are managing all the citizen reports, and this is how they are doing real-time mapping. So. Uh, on the one side, okay, just a quick question. When you say they, you mean both federal and uh, regional governments, and you mean across the political spectrum? 
is that they, everybody? Yeah, I mean across the political spectrum. I mean all the, all the institutions. Not only in Mexico, I will show some other ex examples in other places in Latin America and Africa. Um, and on the one side, we, ha on the, we, have, uh, we have a government, we have citizens that don't trust the government. We have a government that don't trust the citizens. We have uh, media that is not, re that is not reporting uh, what is going on anymore. I don't know if you heard, but there's, there was this ma major newspaper of Ciudad Juarez in the north of Mexico that two years ago, they, their, their first, their, on, on the front page, they said, OK, drug dealers, we give up. What do you want us to say? Um, so these, these kind of things, but has, uh, and then the governments, also the government doing, uh, 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 signing ACTA or promoting this kind of laws that censor the internet in some way. So uh, citizens, we are like in the middle of this spiral of fear and how can we, we, we have no institutions to connect, we have no media that, re, that, that, that study all the situation and citizens are empowering themselves and going to the social networks to connect and to create uh, these, these trusted networks. Um, what these kind of things show, for example, there's, there's a state in Mexico called Veracruz, which is on the, on the east. And uh, there's a law right now in Veracruz that if you report a rumor on Twitter, you can be charged to five years in jail. Um, how do you validate that it's a rumor or not? It's completely arbitrary right now. Um, so this kind of thing not only, not only hurts the internet, which it does, but it shows a radical disconnection between how citizens we are, all, we are already talking uh, between each other and how our government is responding. Um, the, 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 the truth is that we have 21st century citizens that are trying to talk to our 20th, 20th century institutions. Um, however, and as I, as I told you, um, power structures are changing and we have a chance to reframe and rejuvenate our institutions. And society shapes technology, but the use of the, that technology is shaped by the conditions in which that society lives. For example, Twitter, I don't know how you, you, you use Twitter here in Seattle, where in Mexico it's a, it's a life-saving thing. It's, a, uh, it's, it's not a place where I, where, I, where I say that I'm partying at a particular place. It's a place where I say, don't go to this particular place because something's going on. And just uh, going ahead of all this context that I just gave you, um, I'm going into what Citibox is doing. So we're taking advantage of all this situation and we're creating tech tools for civic engagement. We, our main objective is to, through technology, to bridge the gap between and among citizens and their institutions. We have three types of, uh, three types of, uh, of tools. One is oriented totally for decision makers, one is for citizens for participation, and the other one is for accountability. We are in, um, we are in around 10 countries right now, uh, mainly Latin America, where we have made some projects in uh, Eastern Europe and Africa. And we have worked with 50 organizations, 1.5 million citizen reports. Um, let, me, and let me show you a bit about this. Uh, so the first, the first thing, it's, uh, it's a platform that we developed. It's oriented for decision makers. And the main, the main idea is for them to turn reports into actionable information. So what we are doing is um, we are getting all the digital, digital information that is already out there, or if it's not already out there, we try to encourage the, the institutions to uh, go for the information. For example, open up an SMS channel, open up uh, an IVR, a Facebook website, an email, uh, a Twitter account, and then, how can, and then we provide them with a platform so, so they can manage that information in a much more efficient way. Uh, so, and they can analyze also all that information in real time. Um, this, is, this is the platform. So what we are doing is integrating different reporting channels, as you can see here. You can see that it can be on Facebook, it can be Twitter, it can be um, directly from the web or email or whatever. And we are, it's like a Gmail-like interface where the, where the institutions can actually uh, uh, process the reports, validate the information, respond to the citizens in a confidential way, and analyze the information in real time. Uh, as you can see here, the reports can, can have different status. Um, 
it can have different categories. It can be suggest but they create their own categories. And it can have media or not, depending on, 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 the, on the reporter. Um, at the end, is the, the main objective is to close the feedback loop. The feedback loop it's, this, it involves these, uh, several stages. So the first one is data. We need to uh, measure, capture, and store data. How can we uh, put that data into context to make it emotionally resonant? Then uh, there, there must be consequence. How can this, all this uh, information illuminate uh, paths for action? And finally, action and retroaliment uh, and feedback into, into the platform once again. Each, each report, as you can see, is geotag. It can have pictures. You can have a conversation with the, with the, with the citizen. Um, it can have a high priority or not. You can make it public or private if you want to. Um, and it can be verified or not. I'm, I'm going to show you examples of how all institutions are using it. Is this the public view or is that the private decision maker view? This is all, all, all this that I'm showing you is what decision makers are looking at. It's decision makers can be a government institution, it can be an NGO, it can be a company. Uh, but this is where all the, all, the, all the information are coming through and how they are uh, responding to that information. Uh, we are providing also um, real-time analytics. So it maps, heat maps, uh, trends, uh, real-time analysis of all the information. And uh, well, this is another an site. Everything is based on comparative statistics. So the main objective is for you to understand in a, in a, in a single view what is the problem, where is the problem, and when is the problem. And uh, there's also uh, the, the main objective is for this not to, to make much more better, efficient, better decisions based on real data and not based on perceptions only. There was one example, for example, uh, that there, there was this uh, mayor of the, of the north of Mexico that said, I want citizens to, to send me all the information. Uh, I want to test this, this, these tools for, and I want citizens to tell me how should I name the, the new school that I'm building. And around 80% of the reports said, first of all, solve us the water problem that we have. So it's cool always to, to build a school. Nobody will, reply, will, will deny that we need more schools. But there's, there are priorities for citizens. Uh, and well, there are several views that show you for the, the main objectives to make a better decisions. So this is all, all the, the ones that had media. And also, one, 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 other, one other thing is that the conversation is already out there. So on the one, on the one hand, you have all, the, all the, the channels that you're opening up for citizens to report. And on the other side, all the conversation that is already out there in Twitter. So how can you grab all that conversation and also listen to that conversation? So for example, if you, if you look at it here, we are tracking several hashtags in Monterrey. MTY follow, CIC, CIC communities, security, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea is that on the one side, you have all the reports that are contacted you directly. The other side, you have how citizens inter in, uh, in, uh, collaborating between each other. And that you can also analyze that conversation and trying to understand the communities that, uh, around, around that conversation. So what you're looking at right now, it's, um, it's an example of all the conversation that happened during the uh, Venezuelan election. And um, um, well, we've, this, the, the platform, we've implemented this. This is a decision maker platform. I'm going to show you some examples now. But this platform is in Spanish, in English, in French, in Portuguese, in Arabic. It's, it has APIs to receive information and to publish all the information also. So there's a public, there can be a public site or a public applications for citizens uh, to, to also consume the information. And uh, it's centralized user generation. Uh, we've learned a lot in terms of security. Uh, the, the one that is receiving the reports doesn't know the, the identity of the reporter, but they can respond and, and create a conversation with citizens. And there's, um, there's a public side of this. So I'm, I'm going to show you some examples. So the back end, the one that I just showed you, is exactly the same for all our customers. But the front end is different. Uh, so for example, this is uh, Venezuelan elections uh, in, back in October 2012. Uh, we worked with a group of young people, a young, uh, an organization of young people, uh, to track and monitor Venezuelan elections. There was a, a call center. Every, mostly was, was via call center or via Twitter. And we, we trained them on how they should validate the information, how should they take care of the information or and of themselves. And, um, 
and we work together with international institutions for that. Um, also, the Mexican, the Mexican elections. Uh, here we work with the. It was the same, the same example where we started the company back in 2009 with Cuidemos el Voto, but it was a 2012 uh, project. We've learned a lot since then. We tried to work with the, with the, with the official institutions. The Mexican institution that solves uh, election crimes, it's called FEPADE. Uh, it's, the Mexican, it's like the Mexican police that solves all, of crime, all crime uh, related through, to elections. The problem was, first of all, when we, when we tried to work with the FEPADE, they, they, and we told them, we're going to create this platform for citizens to, to report and to participate. And their first uh, answer was, but that means that I'm going to receive a lot of reports and that I'm going to have a lot of things to do. But that's, that, that was the idea, you know, to, receive, to receive a lot of reports and for them to, 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 to encourage citizens to, 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 to monitor their own elections. Then when they, when they agreed that this was going to happen with or without them, they decided to participate. And we said, OK, let's, let's connect our platforms. Give us an API so we can send you all the information in real time. Once we, are, we, 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 we will be responsible of validating all the, all the citizen reports, we will do that. So we created a theme a team of, of around 50 people that were trained, that were receiving all the citizen reports. Once they were able to validate the reports, it, the idea was to forward it to the FEPADE in real time. They said, give us a couple of days till, we'll figure, till we figure out what, about the API. They came back a couple of days and said, we don't know what an API is. And <laughs> so uh, why don't you just send us an email every two, every two hours? Uh, so the elections in Mexico go from 8 p.m. to 6 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and we decided that we were going to send in an email with all the validated reports every two hours. At 12 p.m., <laughs> we received uh, an email from their service saying our email is full. We <laughs> we will not be able to receive more emails, and it didn't work until next Wednesday. Um, so that's how institutions are in Mexico or in Latin America in general. Uh, at the end, we received a lot of reports with the theme, like more than 100,000 reports, and they were able only to validate 700 of those. Um, so it was, it was the, the first election that uh, there was a lot of participation in social media in Mexico, and, the, and our institutions are still uh, 20th century institutions, and sometimes with 19th century processes, as you can see here. Uh, we worked with Internews, with this international organization, to track Ukraine's elections also. Uh, here it was a little bit different. We have two, two, kind or two different kinds of citizen reports. The first one was uh, uh, official observer reports, and the second one was citizen reports. Uh, so the official observers were, were, uh, were validated by, by default and, and, and being published by default. And citizen reports required someone to validate the information, and if they decided to make it publish, then it will make it public. public. Um, they created this campaign that, was, that went viral in, in Ukraine. Uh, I don't understand the, the ad, but it's something about zombies. It's a very cool ad, uh, visually. Uh, you, you, it says something that if you, if you don't vote, you're a zombie, something like that. But it's all the city going out walking as zombies. And it was a viral video in, in, in Facebook and Twitter. Um, we also, this is one very, very interesting. Uh, we, we, we also tracked Yemen's elections uh, last year. Um, here, it was very interesting for, it was not a real election because there was only one candidate and he was already, already the president. But, uh, but that it was a very interesting exercise. Uh, it was the first time in 35 years that people were able to vote, although they were going to vote for the same guy, but they were able to vote. And it was the first time also that women were able to vote. Um, so we received uh, around 9,000 uh, citizen reports via SMS. 100% of the reports were, were via SMS to, the, to this short code here. And uh, what it really got me thinking is that these people, uh, although they, don't have, they, they never lived democracy the way that we have, uh, they, they already understood that elections, is, it's, it's uh, much more than just going out and filling on a paper. They, they were reporting, they were empowering themselves um, and participating. And something very similar happened. This is not real election tracking, but this is something also that happened in Egypt that we were involved. Uh, we integrated it with Facebook. 
and uh, it's the, the Constitutional Assembly of Egypt in uh, last, last year, uh, they may publish the, the Constitution draft. Um, and they ask citizens to participate and to our citizens to participate and to give their, their comments and opinions in five uh, main, uh, main uh, subjects on, this, on the Constitution. It was integrated with Facebook. Um, it's a very big deal, Facebook in, in Egypt also. Um, the, the thing that I like about, about, um, about this project is that people were, the, the, the kind of topics they, they were able to participate were something, uh, what, what should we do with the separation of the church and the state? What should we do with the right to, to protest? What should we do with uh, the right to women in politics and, and, all, and, and, all, and all those kind of things? But one very interesting thing is that um, uh, the dynamics of Egypt and Mexico are very similar. We have around, uh, Egypt, the Egyptian population is 80 million people. They have around 30% internet access, very similar to Mexico. Um, and the other example, the other example that we have prior to Egypt around election election crowdsourcing was Iceland. And Iceland is 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 like a small city. There are two hundred thousand people. Everyone is connected. They have a, 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 a very high economic access. But Egypt, no. And in, in, even though being the case, sixty-eight thousand people participate, and nine hundred eighty-one articles were edited in the constitution thanks to citizen participation. Um, since it was integrated on Facebook, we have de demographics. We know how many female, how many male participated, and how, uh, what ages they have. Um, the, another kind of projects that we have are governance. So this, all, all these that I've just showed you are election tracking and monitoring. This is governance. Governance is where we work with, um, we work with government institutions. Uh, so for example, we just launched um, the open government platform of La Paz, Bolivia, where citizens are reporting and uh, and they, they call it a closer government, not open government, which I think is much better because uh, open government, we are understanding open government as just putting out data and uh, that's it, that's an open government. And I think that's a very, very basic thing to, uh, of, of, of what open government means. It, it, it means that we, it should be useful for citizens. So here is a place where the, the people of La Paz are uh, understanding, are, 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 can, can be aware of where the garbage uh, uh, truck will go to pick up your garbage, when are you uh, going to receive water in your house. So these kind of things that really concern citizens is a place where the government is working as a platform for them to, uh, to understand better the, the dynamics. Uh, this is also a very interesting one, is the Mexican FCC. Um, where you can report all the problems in terms of uh, telecommunication problems. Um, one very interesting thing is that um, we, have, we have analyzed that Telcel, which is the major operator, fails the most on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. We don't know why, but uh, that's when all, most reports happen and there's a pike always, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. So it, it, there's a probability that you will not be able to make a five minute, minute call. At that, at that time, uh, there was this there was this case uh, when Telcel failed in Mexico City uh, a few months ago, and uh, Moni Deswan is the chairman of this institution. He's very active on Twitter, and every time there's a there's a problem in the tele in telecommunications, everybody goes to Twitter and, and 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 criticizes him. And this time, when this happens, he said, "Okay, if you keep on re re sending me on Twitter." Your complaints, I can don't, I, I will not be able to do nothing. Go to the website and uh, actually report, so I can I can have the tools to uh, um, to sue Telcel or do something about it. So this was on a Wednesday, and on the next Monday, uh, the the political pressure was was so powerful uh, because of this uh, in, in this uh, official platform, uh, it was evident that there was a major failure that Telcel decided to reimburse around two dollars to every user, Telcel user in Mexico City, which is a lot. Uh, so uh, peer, peer pressure or um, public shame is very useful sometimes also. Um, and there's another project uh, that I wanted to, sh talk about, to talk about very quickly. It's in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, this one is called Hacemos la Tira Bogota, but let's, let's make Bogota beat. Um, the idea here is to 
you, you report minor crimes, but the most interesting thing is that they don't care about the minor crime. They care about the context of the city when that happened. So when you report that someone stole your cell phone, they will say, okay, how was the city when that happened? Was there light or not? Was there garbage or not? Was there graffiti or not? So we're trying to analyze the context of the city with what happened and with the very philosophical uh, theory that if you solve the context, you solve the problem. Uh, we, we still don't have the idea yet, but we're working on it. And the third, the third one, the third kind of projects is what we call civic innovation. It's where we work with uh, NGOs or with a group of people uh, uh, to make their message much more uh, evident and also uh, to, to make more citizens participate. So, for example, uh, last year, uh, they, they, uh, they, in the US, there was a, a documentary film called uh, Waiting for Superman, about, talking about the education problem. Well, in Mexico, we have our Waiting for Superman. It's called the Panzazo. It's exactly the same. It's, it's talking about the, 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 all the problems that we have in Mexico, which are very different to what you have here. here. But we have the largest uh, union in Latin America, which is a teacher's union. And they are very, very powerful. So they, they create this documentary to exhibit all the problems and all the corruption that's going on in that, in that, uh, in that union. And then they launch this website where, where also they encourage the students to, through their smartphones, to uh, film whatever is going on inside their schools and to make, to make it public. And uh, um, it, 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 it has, it has grown, this, this movement has grown very much, even though, the, and even the, pre, the new president of Mexico in his inaugural speech said that he will make an education reform in, the, in, in, the, in his first year. Let, let's see what happens. But this kind of technology is also combining uh, a traditional tool, a traditional tool like a documentary film, and uh, also for opening up spaces for citizens to participate. We have also this project, uh, as you know, in Mexico, it's the second most uh, dangerous country to be a journalist in the world right now. After Iraq, it's Mexico. Um, so we have a couple of projects there, working with Article 19, uh, which is an organization that, that um, uh, protects journalists. And uh, on, the one, on the one side, we are making public and, uh, all the where most uh, problems happen against journalists in Mexico and, and Central America. And there's also, they are about to launch like a, like a, like a WhatsApp app that is entirely uh, focused for journalists. So the idea is that you will open the app on your smartphone and, will, and it will ask you what kind of, in, 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 of journalism you're doing at that particular place. And based on the kind of journalism you're doing and, and where you are standing, it will tell you, okay, you have a risk of uh, something, take care. And there's also an internal network of, of connecting journalists uh, where you can keep on monitoring and tracking each other and alerting each other. So they are also using the, these kind of tools to protect themselves. And then the Monterrey project. Monterrey it's, uh, is the second largest city in Mexico. Uh, it's in the north of Mexico. And uh, it, 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 since the last three or four years, uh, violence has spread uh, terribly in Monterrey. Uh, citizens have come out, and they created this institution called Centro de Integración Ciudadana, which means Center for Citizen Integration. It's it's an institution financed by, by the businessmen in, in, Mex in Monterrey. And they are connecting all the, all the Twitter conversation, the MTY follow hashtag, and other channels to the official institutions, to the nine municipalities of Monterrey, to the uh, military, and to the state. And, um, and they are also providing free legal and psychological assistance to everyone that, has re that reports to the platform and, uh, and wants it. Uh, they are combining traditional channels to, to advertise the platform like soccer matches or a physical space in the malls. And there has, there has been excellent examples of how citizens are engaging the government another way around. Um, for example, there was, there, there's, um, they, they are making public once, once a month in the major newspaper of the city how, how many reports have they received each municipality of Monterrey, how they are responding, uh, and if they are not responding. So they are putting a lot of pressure on the municipalities to engage. Um, one, one example that I love is uh, somewhat, somebody reported that they, they have stolen their car. And, 
they, they, the, the community started retweeting that information and, and telling them, I've seen your car here, I've seen your car here. And it took 11 minutes until someone said, your car is parked here. Uh, so that, that really talks about the sense of community and, and the sense of social fabric being um, uh, reconstructed, regenerated. Um, that, that, uh, that we, all that I've shown you so far, it's uh, some examples of what we've been doing in the last two years. Uh, now we, we, we learn a lot. Uh, we are constantly open to, you know, to, to failure. That's why we are innovating. And, um, and we are experimenting a lot and seeing all the results that, we're, that, uh, that, um, that we're having. But as you can, as you have you seen all that, all those dynamics that I've showed you are all in Latin America or Middle East or Africa. We have, we don't have one project yet uh, with dynamics, with the dynamics of a developed country like the U.S. Um, the thing is, in in, in Mexico, um, 80, in, in the U.S., 87 percent of Americans participate in a in a in a sport group, in a, a academic group in a religious group or in a neighborhood group or uh, whatever, 87% of the US, of Americans. In Mexico, it's only around 6%. So we don't have a culture of participating, not only in Mexico, not in entire Latin America. So there's no, if we don't participate, we don't know each other, we don't trust each other, and uh, so on and so on. Um, so the, I, th I think the best tool, the best tool still uh, that has been used for, for neighbors, mainly for neighbors, to uh, communicate between each other and to make better decisions has been since the 90s, Yahoo groups and Google groups. And these tools have been involved since then. Um, that's where, city, where your neighbors are, are organizing themselves. How, how should they decorate uh, the, their street on Halloween? Or who's the next on the car in, in the, uh, for, to, to take the children to school or, or whatever? So right now, what we are doing, it's we are we we are just uh, have uh, we haven't launched it yet, but we just approved get up, got approved an, an app on the Apple Store yet. We haven't migrated to other platforms, but uh, we want to foster self-organized uh, civic interactions. We want to create to to create the tools for citizens to create this, the same dynamics that that are going on in Yahoo groups or Google groups, and um, to create communities. So. What we are doing, it's, it's, our, it's our first consumer web uh, application. If, if you have an iPhone and go to the Apple Store, you can download the CityBox app. Um, the idea is, uh, it is a citizen-centric approach when we are trying also to control the source of information and to create a platform where citizens can, uh, can create their own, their own interactions, whatever they want. The idea for here is to every, every citizen to create a community uh, to invite people to join their community, to geotag the community so the community can only be discovered in a particular place. So for example, we can have a community of Redmond and if I go to Seattle, I will not be able to see that community. Only when I'm in Redmond, I will be able to, to see that community. So the main, object, the main idea for this is, um, the idea behind this is institutions uh, being private or public, we cannot make better decisions on how to improve people's lives if we limit public participation to voting every once in a while. We, there need to be tools for citizens also to collaborate and to engage. Twitter has been the best tool right now. I think there, there are much more uh, civic interaction in Twitter than in any other platform combined, of, of civ civic platform combined. Um, however, Twitter is a very noisy monologue. And I think there can be there can be better solutions replic basing, uh, replicating all the dynamics that is already happening on, um, on Yahoo groups or, or, or Google groups. So this is, this is a new thing that we're doing. It's a consumer web app. If you, if you go to your, uh, to your app iPhone, if you have one, it will be great to receive feedback from you. We haven't launched it yet. I think it will take uh, yeah, uh, a couple of months since we launched it. Um, and uh, finally, just just to wrap up this, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, open open government and open data and all that. We are very much involved in that. We are, we we uh, we organize a lot of, a lot of hackathons in Mexico and Latin America, open data hackathons where we put together um, we put together developers, designers, um, journalists, and, and government officials 
for 36 hours in the same room and uh, seeing what happens if they, they, they need to enter. Um, we're actually collaborating with Microsoft in the next hackathon, which is tomorrow, uh, Microsoft Mexico. Uh, but one thing is that uh, the idea that the idea that transparency will restore uh, public trust in democracy rests on the on, on a very on a very fail very very fragile assumption, which is if only people knew, everything would be different. And we we have find out is that people we don't sometimes we don't want to know sometimes we don't care if we know. So the idea that if I know how much money was spent on the street outside my house, uh, and the street has a lot of potholes, it will make, the idea is that it will make me, uh, it will make me anger and it will make me wanna, par wanna participate and say, hey, you should, you should do that. But that's not always, that's not always the case. Sometimes uh, um, the end of government secrecy with these open government and open data movements does not mean does not mean necessarily the, 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 the birth of the informed citizen. Um, no, and, and, and we, we need to find ways of, of how to really engage the citizen and how to citizen really engage with the governments and participate with the governments. Uh, I'm not saying that these kind of efforts are wrong. We're, 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 we have done this for, uh, for the last two years and we will continue doing, doing it because we're trying to create a community of civic hackers that are um, participating with their governments. In the, in, the, in the 20th century, the hackers of the system were the lawyers because they knew how the system worked and they knew the, the, the problems of the system. The hackers of the system or 21st century are, are engineers because, because that's, that's, that's how the government is moving. So we need, we need to create this community of developers and hackers that want to participate and um, to uh, to make um, all other cities create tools for all, for governments opening up and participating and and also citizens to participate. Transparency is not only governments opening up; it's also citizens asking questions. So we need to create those platforms. Um, this is this is the this is uh, we've, as I've told you we've done we've we've done two kinds of hackathons. The one is in Mexico, entirely in Mexico. And the second one, we're part of this movement called Desarrollando America Latina, which means developing Latin America, where we put eight countries, eight different countries of Latin America, we hacked together during one, the first weekend of December, and we compete between each other and ha find the best solutions between each other. Um, tomorrow, as I've told you, it's the first hackathon that we're doing outside Mexico City. It's, it will be in Monterrey. That's why I have to go back uh, so early. But um, but mainly is that um, in, in, in Latin America, in Mexico, and in the US, I think uh, this open government stuff, it's, it's, it's great. It's a, it's a great movement that, needs, that we need to pursue, but we haven't seen results yet. And sometimes it's very frustrating when we don't see results, and it, this has been around for two or three years, and there hasn't been like really life-changing results in the, in the kind of democracy we're living. Um, but perhaps it's the same, the same thing that uh, I was discussing yesterday with a friend, that speaking the truth is not, it, everybody knows in Mexico who the drug dealers are. Everybody knows in Mexico who, what, what, who, are the, who are the corrupted politicians and what kind of side businesses corrupted politicians have. Everybody knows. If you want to know where El Chapo Guzman is living, ask the neighbors. They already know. There's a difference between knowing the truth and speaking the truth. I don't think Wiki, the WikiLeaks cable actually said something that you don't know already. We already knew everything that the WikiLeaks cable said. The, 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 that's, that's the main difference. And we need to create tools to protect citizens and to encourage citizens to take personal risk and confront the powerful and speak out the truth. And hopefully, eventually, this can lead to real change um, in our cities and in our, in our democracies. Yeah. Thank you. questions uh, you might have. So to what extent um, do you feel, um, especially in the context of elections, because that's an important part of this, that um, the governments um, that you work with uh, are willing to be partners in, in building a more transparent system? Um, well, what, what we find, have found out also is that during the election, one, one very interesting thing is that during the election day, um, it's very complicated now 
to to actually reseal to actually governments to 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 create a, a major gov uh, election fraud fraud. It, it's 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 it happens before if it happens. So we we also need to 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 create tools that can monitor the elections before, not only during the elections, because during the elections there's a lot of eyes uh, looking at the election. There are a lot of institutions looking at the elections. Um, but the governments, governments uh, where we have worked, uh, sometimes it can be complicated, uh, like the Venezuela case. But mainly it's candidates, the ones that they don't want to use these kind of tools. Uh, the candidates in Latin America, in the Latin American context, they are using, they are using these kind of tools, but to, to, for, for election purposes uh, uh, exclusively. For example, there's, there, there was, I, was, I was telling yesterday that we had this project uh, in, the, in the west of Mexico where we have, we, we, we've been running this project for a couple of years about citizen reports and all that. And when there were elections, the candidate used it, that, the, the one that was the governor, used that database instead of, of using the database to, to say, hey, vote for me. And that, that, that really hurt the project, the, the, the platform, and we lost trust with, with the citizens. So um, they are understanding these kind of tools, uh, that there, there's a risk of these kind of tools. In, in Mexico, Twitter was a very, there was a war on, the hash, on hashtags on Twitter. But I don't, I don't think that it was really changed the mind of people. There, there's a conversation that's going on on Twitter that does not, does not reflect the conversation of the real polling stations. I guess I'm asking about this slightly different kind of tool, um, and that is, um, if a government is is willing to participate in doing so, it's possible to build an election system such that citizens individually can can check on their own and see if there's fraud, and and see if the the, the election is run properly and see where the fraud is if there is fraud. But the government would have to be a partner in building the system, and do you? you know, think from your experience that the government you work with would be willing to build a system that allowed citizens to see when there's fraud? Well, uh, most of the time, this kind of project, when we're talking with governments, first of all, what we need is political will, because the tools are already out there. The city, uh, so it needs a lot of political will. But they, need, they also need to understand that if, in Mexico, I don't remember one single election that hasn't been questioned. Never. Uh, and it, it can be a great tool for the government said, hey, you want to question the, ne the next election, let's, let's do it open, let's do it as open as possible, and you will see that not, there's no problem with elections. So it can also be a tool for them also to, to, to open up and to talk to citizens, but they, they need the political will. Yeah. And I don't think that Latin America will be the first, uh, anyone in Latin America will be the first country to do that. I'm, I'm thinking of something more specific, but we should talk about this offline. So what's the model that the city box uses? Do you, do you approach you know, governments or these public institutions? Do they, are you like a consultant? They hire you and you have to do this design work? Well, what, what, it's a business, no? So is, is it, do they have a business model? Is it a non-for-profit kind of an organization? Or, and who funds the organization? Is it the, the clients, foundations, how does it work? We are a for-profit business. Uh, and yeah, they, they pay for the platform. That's our main business model. So the, the governments or the institutions or the decision makers in general wants to use the platform, they pay for the platform. Uh, uh, it, de it depends, the, the pricing it depends on the our level of involvement. We can be very much involved in the, in the strategy and implementation of this, and we can only provide the technology for them to create, and they create their strategy, so that, that depends. The new product that we're launching that is for consumers, um, it's, it's completely for free. We want, we want First of all, to understand the dynamics, if we are really adding value or not, and then we will figure out how can we make money from that. But uh, yeah, most of most of, and most of the time they, they they contact us or we sell them the, the services. Sorry, uh, over there. Yeah. Uh, I'll go after. Um, so you said you had a project in Africa, which was in West Africa. Yeah, we did we did uh, Benin's elections. I'm sorry. Benin's. We covered Benin's elections uh, in 2010, 11, I think. And uh, we work with an organization called uh, For Selection. And uh, we trained uh, the, peop the people from Benin in Washington, D.C. And then we, they, they went on the field and they, uh, we connected to Frontline SMS uh, for, for us to receive all, all the incoming SMSs. There was a power out, uh, out, 
outbreak. The, the first, there were two elections. One was the, the president and the other one was the parliament. And in the president elections, there was a public outbreak and we lost around 17,000 reports. Uh, but we learned from that. And three weeks later, when we was the parliamentary, the legislative elections, uh, we, we, we created all the, the replication of systems and security that we needed. And we received around 30,000 reports, but it was completely SMS based. Um, it was a very, we have all the case study if you want it, I can send it to you. How do you manage, how do you deal with people that try to manipulate the system? From trolls to, for example, in the case of Panzaso, I'm assuming that perhaps this, the, the union would have a motive to try to manipulate what's going on in the discussion. How do you deal with that? Um, well, first of all, the, the reports that are coming uh, through Twitter, uh, we are we 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 have a uh, couple of algorithms that doesn't let bots Twitter bots to 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 participate, and also that doesn't let replication of tweets. So if you already said something, the the next one will not come. Uh, so that's keeping it a little bit clean. But uh, the institution that is receiving the reports needs to verify the information. So all the reports are not being made public. Uh, well, they can decide if they want to make all, all of them made public at, uh, at the beginning or, or private. But uh, if they if they receive the reports, they validate the information, and they decide if they if they make public each report. However, that does not affect the the internal the internal the internal analytics. There's there's a particular um, we have an option for each report to be marked as a spam. If you mark it as a spam, then the system starts learning. That that kind of that particular person or that combination of words, uh, if it happen again, it will be marked uh, as spam. So the, the system is learning, but it needs human interface right now for um, to to help them learn. Yeah, you would you had talked about the problems, or the frustrations of having open government solutions in place for a while and not seeing results. And yesterday we were talking about one of the things that you think is a precondition for success is to create greater trust in the community and that will make these institutions more legitimate and more effective. Is there some data metric that you are looking at that is a proxy for increasing trust so that you'll know if you're being successful or are you just monitoring participation? Is there some measurement of, a, of an outcome of increasing social capital that comes out of this uh, system? Well, right now we're measuring uh, participation and how has it changed, uh, increasing or decreasing. Uh, we're also measuring the response of, of the institutions, if, if how they are responding and if it has, if it has changed their, their processes or the way they are thinking. It, uh, it's very complicated to have uh, a quantitative metric of this kind of this kind of things, are, at, at the end, it's it's all intangible capital. It's it's how are we trusting each other? Are we uh, innovating processes? Are we opening up our spaces? I think open government and the, the the use of all tech tools for civic interaction. We are in a very very early stage. We are we are all learning. There's no silver bullet, and uh, if we are going into this space, I think uh, the 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 problem is that eight nine thousand reports in Yemen is that a lot or is that uh, very little? I, I don't know. Uh, it's it's a it's a much bigger population, but or sixty four thousand reports in Egypt in an eighty million population is that a lot or not? It, so it depends. It, it's it, there there are there are way of the of the coin to see it. Sixty four thousand people that wouldn't be able to participate if they didn't you know have this tool. So. Um, I think we're still learning, and eventually, I hope uh, we will be able to to have qualitative and quantitative metrics that can tell us if this is working or not working. Yeah, I was wondering for your um, the mobile app that you're working on. How are you? Um, how are you letting are people forming the groups? Yep. Just like whatever group that they want that's in that area, or whoever the group they want. Uh, we are not controlling the platform right now. It's, uh, we want it to make to be very open, mm -hmm. and to see what how they are participating. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like a reply all model. It's supposed to like the Twitter broadcast. 
<laughs> it's the ones that are in, inside one community. You can, you can discover communities, and you can join a community. And if you are in that particular community, you will receive the information. Thanks a lot. Oh, yes. oh, one more. Um, so one of the problems we seem to face in, in our area is that there's so much data available online and so few people who have the skills to analyze and decide what's meaningful. And um, you know the, the news media, the professional news media is just in decline because their revenue model almost is going out of existence. Um, and so one of the things that one of the groups I'm involved in is thinking about doing is actually doing workshops and training to teach ordinary citizens more about what to look for and how to how to dig through the data the government provides, and I'm just curious if if uh, you've looked at doing anything like that to create more citizen activists who are willing to to volunteer to do the analysis that the professional news media is not capable of doing anymore. Uh, yeah, we're we're seeing uh, through through these kind of tools, we're seeing a lot of uh, people that are really analyzing the information and, and, and doing the work that journalists are not doing. In Mexico, the, the thing that we have is, or what, you know, we, we don't have investigative journalism. Uh, we, have, we, have, uh, we have press releases. So the media are working as press releases. And, but one very interesting thing is that they, they take a lot of their information from Twitter. So Twitter, although it's a very close community in Mexico, around, only around, uh, there are two million accounts, something like that. Uh, all the information that happens on Twitter, the media replicates it and then goes to the TV or goes to the newspapers, and that's how people are uh, analyzing uh, or receiving their news. But there are people out there, uh, there, are, there, are, there are people out there that are uh, analyzing all the, the public data of the crime-related uh, numbers that, 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 are, that are out there and they're there they're, or, or comparing the how people are buying uh, how the governments are buying stuff up to whom so they are doing it just for fun I don't think there's an institution that is really doing this kind of work on a regular basis in Mexico but uh, at the end these kind of tools what they are opening up it, what they are doing is they're opening up spaces for more amateurs more people that go out there and play with the data and then perhaps discover something and through Twitter making it up uh, making it available to, to everyone. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot, everyone, for coming. And we're going to be hanging out for a few minutes.